taking the courtesy to make sure my mic's on. Microphones in churches are like Christians. Without the power, you may as well just throw it away. So good to have you in church tonight. How many are glad to be in God's house on a Sunday night? And uh, is there any water in that baptismal tank right now? I might take a quick lap or two before I preach. (laughs) I came prepared tonight to preach on prophecy and got out in the parking lot, and I thought maybe the Lord's trying to tell me to preach on hell. But uh, anyway, God bless you for being in the house of God. By the way, I always look out from this platform when I come to this church and uh, so genuinely proud of the young people here and the youth group. And uh, God is raising up a special generation of special force warriors in the kingdom of God at Calvary Full Gospel Assembly. I hope all of you that are here will take the lead. And let me encourage you, and I already see a young man in the front row uh, ready to take notes. And uh, I'm assuming he's getting ready to take notes. He might be writing a love letter to his girlfriend. I'm not real sure. (laughs) Don't make me come down there and check on you. But it's always been that way. Every time I've been here, you've always had such a great uh, youth ministry here. And uh, the the church, if the Lord tarries, is in good hands. You have a bright future here. How many brought your Bibles tonight? Revelation chapter 13. Uh, Pastor Farina asked me to uh, receive an offering for the ministry tonight. Let me just tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, Many of you already are familiar with the ministry of Lost Lamb, and you know what I've done over the course of, uh, Judy and I will soon be celebrating, matter of fact, June 23rd, uh, for Judy and I, it'll be 43 years of marriage and 43 years of evangelism and missions full time, and I thank God for that. I always tease her and say, you know, you do realize you have the absolute perfect marriage, Uh, Some women tell their wives to leave. You just have to be patient. I leave all the time. (laughs) You have to just put up with me in short spurts. But uh, many of you know that we're uh, dog lovers, and when our kids grew up and and got married and left home, uh, we had a dog at that time by the name of Hunter, and Hunter uh, received extra affection and attention from my wife during that time because the kids were gone and we had empty nest syndrome. Now, some Parents, when they have empty nest syndrome and their kids are gone, uh, they run around and shout and sing and throw parties. They're so happy about it. But my wife truly grieved when our kids left home. And if I'm honest, uh, I still miss them. And uh, I live a thousand miles away from my son and uh, my daughter-in-law and, and, and Camila. But my, my daughter and, and her husband, they pastor in a foreign country called Canada. And right now, it wouldn't matter how far away we lived, you can't cross the border. And I have two grandchildren on that side of the border and rarely get to see my grandchildren. One of the things that I really uh, am covetous about uh, Pastor David and Elaine is uh, their opportunity to be with their grandchildren. We were driving to church this morning, and Pastor J.D. picked me up, and his two little munchkins were in the back seat, and I turned around, and I was talking to them, and... I was asking his son, I said, I see since I was here last time you shaved your beard off. And he said, I don't have a beard. I said, are you sure? No, I don't have a beard. And then in typical little boy fashion, about five seconds went by and he said, Gigi does. (laughs) And Gigi said, I do not. (laughs) But I sure love and appreciate the Farina family and and, uh, give them... Uh, honor, which is due. They're, they're precious, precious people. How many of you know God's blessed you with great, godly leadership with integrity here? <laughs> Always a pleasure. By the way, tomorrow night, Monday night, if the Lord tarries, by the way, everybody say 7 o'clock. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 7 o'clock each night, and we'll be singing and speaking each night. And as Pastor has mentioned, don't forget your lost lamb covenants. Prayer changes things. I was in one of our Lost Lamb Crusades recently, and the pastor uh, spoke to me on Sunday afternoon at lunch. He said, Tiff, I have a confession to make. And I had been to that church uh, multiple times. And uh, he said, through the years, we've always used your Lost Lamb Covenant strategy to encourage our people to pray for their families and loved ones. 
And he said, this year the Lord convicted me because I was holding it up every Sunday and asking my people to pray. And I noticed that my card was empty the week before you came and I got convicted. And so I began to write down the names of people that I was going to pray for before you came. And he said, the first person's name that I wrote down uh, was a well-known family in the area. He said, not only myself, but my father had known this family for almost 40 years. He said, before I was ever born. He said, but they were unsaved and good people, but extremely wealthy and very influential in the business community. And though we had had a friendship through the years, I had always prayed that God would save this man, but I hadn't prayed persistently. He said, he was the first name that I put down on my lost lamb covenant, and I prayed every day this week before you came that God might somehow do something that none of our family had been able to do to build that bridge. And he said, Sunday morning, this morning when you gave the invitation, as I always do, as I'll do tonight, I always give people an opportunity to receive Christ every time I speak. But he said, you always say, if you're a Christian, take notice of the people that are around you. And if you have a friend or a family member or a loved one or someone you've invited and they've never given their heart to Christ or maybe you don't know if they've ever made that commitment, just turn to them and say, I'll walk with you. And he said, as the invitation progressed and people were walking forward, he said, I was startled by somebody tapping me on the shoulder. And I turned around and it was that businessman that I had put on my list, number one on my list. He tapped me on the shoulder and he said, Pastor will you walk with me? And he said, that was the man that I walked uh, forward with tonight. Their family had uh, witnessed or had relationship with that man for close to 40 years, but persistent prayer made a difference. Never give up until the rapture takes place. Never give up praying for friends and family and those that God brings into your circle. Will you stand to your feet? I want to just begin with praying for your family tonight. How many of you know that it's God's will that nobody in your family should perish, but everyone should have eternal life? And where do we find that? It's found in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. There the Bible says, and it's God speaking, he said, I am willing that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. That word perish in the Bible means face judgment for unrepented sin. It's the same Greek word from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why? That you should not perish, but have everlasting life. God doesn't want anybody to perish. I was being interviewed by a paper one time, and they said, how can you as preachers on one Sunday, you preachers preach on the love and the forgiveness and the mercy of God, and then you turn around on another Sunday and preach on hell and judgment and wrath. Isn't that a contradiction? I said, not at all. He said, well, how can a God of love ever send anybody to a place that you preach so graphically about called hell? Because in my crusade that week, one of the nights had been advertised, I was preaching on the subject, the hard truth about hell, and somehow they had gotten a hold of that advertising. I said, well, what many people don't understand is that God never sends anybody to hell. If you study the Bible, you'll find that God never sent anybody to hell. You make that decision. He said, I'm willing that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. Hell, if you'll study the gospel of Matthew, Jesus said, was not even created for the human race. It was created for fallen angels and demonic spirits and Satan. But if you go there, it won't be because God sent you there. It'll be because when you stand before him in judgment day, you will have rejected your only opportunity to be forgiven. Your rebellion, your stubbornness, your desire to live like you want to live and ignore Christ. You had made your own decision. No one goes to heaven by accident. All will be there because of a deliberate choice. And no one goes to hell by accident. All will be there because of a deliberate choice. God has done everything in his power to make sure you make it to heaven. He gave his only son. But people have to make a choice. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Choose you this day, Joshua said, whom you will serve. 
As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Will you in childlike faith for your family and for your children and your grandchildren just raise a hand to heaven and let's come into prayer and agreement. Father, for these precious people before I ever preach a single word, I pray for their families that none would perish as your word declares, but all would come to repentance. Some of them that have hands before you in prayer as a symbol of faith and agreement Their children used to serve the Lord, but they've wandered away. Some raised their kids in the ways of the Lord, but as they got older, they forgot the most basic things of eternity. And today they're lost. We call them home by prayer. Whatever it takes. We dare to pray whatever it takes. Bring them back before it's eternally too late. Give us all the courage and the faith to be a witness this week. And may it be as it was in the book of Acts, add to the church daily such as should be saved. And if there are people here tonight who are not at peace with God or have wandered away or are backslidden or are cold and indifferent or in all of the COVID drama, they lost themselves in the fog of secularism. I pray that tonight they'd come home when the invitation is given. Help me to preach it straight and clear, but may every word be covered in the grace and the love and the mercy of the Lord. And we pray and ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I leaned over to Pastor David and I said, I'm a preacher's kid, and so I'm pretty much accustomed with giving honor to whom honor is due and the way I was raised is Sunday belongs to the house of God and so uh, I don't really feel led to take an offering tonight but I will say this if you feel led to give one nobody's going to harass you (laughs) but let me just leave that between you and the Lord and uh, I'll say this tonight and it goes for the entire week if you're a guest or you're a visitor or someone invited you Uh, Whoever invited you didn't invite you to be a blessing to me. It's my prayer that I can be a blessing to you. And a lot of people don't know it, but in the Bible, in the book of 3 John, the Bible says that traveling ministries should never put financial pressure upon unsaved people. That's in the Bible. And uh, I know that the trend these days in many churches is for guest ministries to take 15 minutes, 30 minutes. I've been in situations where it was over an hour to take an offering. Can I say this in humility but be blunt? I'm not a beggar. I'm a preacher. And I learned a long time ago whose responsibility it is to provide for the ministry. That's God's responsibility. If I'll do his work, his way, and live with holy hands, he'll take care of me. My blessing doesn't come from pleading and begging and twisting arms. The blessing of lost lamb is because of the giving and the sowing uh, that this ministry does. The Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. Many traveling ministries and many evangelists need to learn. If you want to be blessed, quit being a taker and be a giver. Because when you learn to be a giver, then you open up a channel of God's favor And uh, I say this humbly, but truthfully, I've learned to walk in that favor. So the only thing that I ask, it's the same thing I've asked since I was 17 years old. I'm 62 and I've never changed in that regard. I hope I've become more like Jesus and less like myself. But between now and Wednesday night, will you just pray and ask God what he would have you to give and then be obedient to that? The last time I was here... And I mentioned to you, I think we're going to have a video before the week's over of uh, some precious people in the Arctic Circle uh, saying thank you. I was talking to a spiritual son in the ministry who he and his wife and two boys uh, live full time as missionaries in the Arctic Circle. And for about 20 years, he's been my boots on the ground. I've gone to the Arctic Circle for this will either be my 20th or 21st year. There's over 100 villages in the Arctic Circle on the American side, American citizens. Over a hundred villages with no preacher, no church, no gospel. 
And uh, we've been working hard through the years to sow into that and, and have seen some great uh, miracles. And I'm not going to talk about that tonight other than to say the last time I was here, uh, through your generosity, we were able to, uh, to help a work in Shaq Tulik. And uh, before the week is over, uh, they're going to say thank you. And so uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, as always, for a, a nice place to rest my head at night. Uh, thank you especially this week for picking accommodations with air conditioning. And uh, I, I probably am a little more uh, less formal here than other places. My policy at the ministry is I don't charge for anything. I take care of our own travel, our own hotel, uh, our own food expenses. I never ask churches for a dime. And, uh, but I think, as you might imagine, the Farinas aren't having any of that. And uh, through the years, they've always put us in a wonderful place to rest. And, and I always, uh, I try to limit myself on carbs when I'm here or when I travel, but never here. I always come off of that. There's just too many good Italian restaurants with these people to try to go carb free. So uh, pray for my belt while I'm here. I don't want it to snap while I'm preaching and thrash half a dozen of you to death before we can get it stopped. But uh, in all sincerity, I appreciate your kindness and generosity to me through the years, and thank you from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> Revelation chapter 13. How many were here this morning? What a wonderful response. And uh, pastor told me that most of the faces at the altars were uh, new faces and new salvations and people that had been invited. Wonderful job. Don't uh, quit. Let's push right through uh, Wednesday night. Wouldn't it be wonderful to see at least a hundred first-time decisions for Christ between now and Wednesday? I believe the Lord could help us to do that and even greater. Tomorrow night I'm preaching on the subject, Is the Antichrist Alive Today? Tonight and through the rest of the week, I'll be preaching each, each night on Bible prophecy and doing my best to help explain some of the things about the end times that we're currently living in. Uh, tonight I'm preaching on can you take the mark of the beast accidentally. Tomorrow night is the Antichrist alive today. Don't miss Tuesday night. I hope you don't miss any night. But Tuesday night's going to be something that I think will be a great blessing to you and especially young people as you go into a drastically changing world. Um, I'm preaching on the subject, how to walk in the favor of God in the last days. I think we need to understand some biblical management on how we live, how we plan, and things that will help you. Uh, God, even in difficult times, his covenant never fails. But there are biblical instructions for us that we have to be mindful of. If the Lord will help me, I'll make those very clear on Tuesday night. And then Wednesday night... I'll be preaching on the subject, what will happen to America in the last days. A Bible prophecy mentions 15 nations by name in end time prophecy. 15 nations specifically by name are addressed. It's not accidental that in these last days uh, you're watching the hatred and the escalation and anti-Semitism against Israel and the Jewish people. It wasn't but days ago. Uh, they took our stimulus tax dollars that were sent over to a foreign country, and now we found out that with them they bought thousands of rockets and for several days pelted the nation of Israel uh, with rockets. And we're living in a very perplexing time, but America, and I've preached this for 40 years, not this message, but this thought, it is frightening to me that in final Bible prophecy, America is suspiciously absent. It is frightening to me that in final Bible prophecy, America is suspiciously absent. But 40 years of study has brought me into a greater understanding. There are four biblical scenarios uh, for America, potentially from the Bible, and they'll all be from the Bible. None of them are conspiracy theories. I'm not that kind of preacher. You'll always hear me start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible. I've had, uh, I don't know about you, but I've had my fill of social media 
well, I'll just stop right there and behave myself. <laughs> Let's just say when the Bible said in the last days there would be a rise of false prophets, I had no idea that they'd all be on the internet. So, again, I better stop. Revelation 13, let's get headed in the right direction. Amy, in my office, if you're editing, you can begin the edit right here. Tonight I want to preach on the subject of can you take the mark of the beast accidentally? And once again, somebody asked me not long ago, How do you arrive at the subjects that you preach on, the material that you preach on, Bible prophecy that you preach on, and so on? I said, well, this may surprise you, but as an evangelist, my number one target audience is unchurched, unreached, unsaved people. That's the number one target audience for a true evangelist. My hero, Dr. Billy Graham, said, if you're not winning the lost, you're not an evangelist. And I believe that. The job of the evangelist. In Ephesians 4, God gave five specific giftings to the church. They are the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. And those are the spiritual giftings that God crafted for the church. I heard an old scholar many years ago say that in the Bible, the Holy Spirit, in typology, one of the types of the Holy Spirit is a dove. And of course, we understand from the baptism of Jesus in the River Jordan by John the Baptist that as Jesus was being baptized, the Father spoke from heaven, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus obviously standing in the waters of baptism, and then the scripture says the Holy Spirit, like a dove, descended upon him. The Holy Spirit is symbolic in the dove. And that old preacher said that a dove has five tail feathers. But if you were to pluck any of those tail feathers or one were damaged, then that dove loses the ability to fly in a straight line and will forever have trouble flying according to course. And I thought as the point was made in his message that the church needs the proper overlapping of all five gifts to move in God's divine direction. And the evangelist is just one of the five gifts. And the job of the evangelist is to preach the gospel and to call people to decision. So as I begin tonight, I'm not here to give you a prophecy college lecture. I hope you'll learn some things tonight. I remind you that Revelation 1-3 says that any time you listen to Bible prophecy or it's read that there's a supernatural blessing. So I can promise you as I did this morning that all week long as you make an effort to be in the house of God, your pastors are very careful about who they allow to stand in the sacred desk. You have wise, intelligent leadership here. And they're careful. They don't overburden the church with foolish guest speakers. But when your pastor set aside special days for special meetings like this, they're doing it for a purpose. And the purpose this week is not only to preach the gospel of Jesus, but to do it in the context of Bible prophecy that we're currently living in, and then to give people an opportunity to receive Christ. So if you're here tonight and you're away from the Lord, as I'm preaching, just quietly, not out loud, but in your heart, begin to whisper to the Lord in prayer. Father, will you give me the courage tonight to receive Christ when he gives that invitation? Will you give me the humility to receive salvation tonight and to walk into your grace and forgiveness and favor? And the Bible says all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the titles of my messages, almost without exception, are questions that people ask me that are unsaved because that's my target audience. And so this question and questions very similar to this have been very, very popular, as you might imagine, in light of the vaccine and all of the controversy that surrounds it. Now, I am not a political person. I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't trust any of them. I trust Jesus. 
I trust the Father. I trust the Holy Spirit. I trust his words and an inner circle of people that I've known through a lifetime of experience that I have trusted. But I don't trust this political world. I think there's corruption on both sides of the aisle. And I think Christians who have an unnecessary focus upon politics in the last days are making a mistake. Because the Bible said, I will lift up my eyes under the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. My help cometh from the Lord. I'm not depending in these last days upon any secular godless institution to pave my way to glory. I am building my life upon the foundation of the eternal Bible and the eternal God who by the eternal spirit penned it and the word of God like a perfect map will lead you from where you're at to where God wants you to be. If you believe and receive it, give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. Revelation 13, verse 11. Then I saw another beast. Pause right there just very quickly. Revelation 13. All of Revelation is important, but Revelation 13 is very significant. Why? Because in Revelation 13, we have the clear unveiling of what is oftentimes called, or at least I call, the unholy trinity. In Revelation 13, if we read the entirety of the chapter, it begins by talking about the first beast, another beast, and the dragon. So if you're a brand new Christian, in Revelation 13, the first beast is the Antichrist. The second beast is the false prophet, and the dragon is Satan. And if you're taking notes, this is solid Bible prophecy gold. Don't miss it. It is the first pure unveiling of the unholy trinity in the last days just as there's a holy trinity god the father god the son god the holy ghost in the last days satan has an unholy trinity it's satan the antichrist and the false prophet and after the rapture of the church they will be allowed to come to a higher level of political influence and they will change the world as we know it Also in Revelation 13, we see the five political agendas of the last days. Everything that's going on, not only in our nation, but around the world. Read the agenda on the United Nations website. Everything that's going on with globalism, with socialism, with all of the political wokeness culture and so on, is the five political agendas of Revelation 13 in their infancy, trying to force their way into the culture. But the Bible said, Paul the apostle to the church at Thessalonica, that until the church is removed, there is a hindering power so that the Antichrist and that unholy trinity cannot be released until the rapture of the church. Let me put that in straight English for you tonight. As long as the church is on the earth, we're in charge. We are both large and we are in charge. Never underestimate the power of the holy church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of the Lord will never pass away. That's why they've tried to silence the church and had such crazy mandates that were unfair to the church. Bars were open, malls were open, restaurants were open, and still in many countries of the world, they mandate the church to be closed. My daughter and my son-in-law's church, all of their members were fined $500 each as they left the church Sunday two weeks ago. Family of seven, $3,500 in fines. But everything else is open. Many of you have seen that our neighbors to the north are imprisoning pastors. One put in solitary confinement, not even given a blanket or a pillow. And yet we've got legislation where they're turning known criminals loose on the earth. 
There is a hatred against this gospel that I preach. The Bible prophesied it as a sign of the times. I'm not preaching on it tonight, but the five political agendas of the last days are in Revelation 13. Those five political agendas, number one, a one-world government. It's coming. Number two, a one-world leader. It's coming. His name is the Antichrist. By the way, he'll never run for political office like John F. Antichrist. He'll be a real person with a real name in real power, but the Bible calls him the Antichrist. A one-world government, a one-world leader, a one-world monetary system. We're going to cover that tonight. Number four, a one-world religion. That's why for the first time in history, you're listening to the only pope in Catholic history. And this is not a shot against Catholic. If you're Catholic, I love you and appreciate you. My wife was born and raised Catholic. But even in the Catholic world, there is tension and upheaval. Because for the first time in Catholic history, the Pope has endorsed sexual sins, homosexuality, and is traveling the world promoting a one-world religion. The Bible prophesied that in Revelation 13. And then the fifth political agenda is a one-world military power that will enforce the mandates of the one-world government. So everything that's going on in the world today is the pre-evolution of those five political agendas. If I had another night, I'd preach on it. But just make a quick note of that because everything that's going on in our country right now is moving towards Revelation 13. One world government, one world leader, one world economy, one world religion, one world military power to enforce the mandates of that wicked global power. Then I saw another beast. The second beast is the false prophet. Come up out of the earth. He had two horns like those of a lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast. Remember, the first beast is the Antichrist. These are things that I would mark in the margin of my Bible, if you have your Bible. And he required all the earth. All the earth. Highlight those three words. All the earth. That's how I arrive at one world or global because the Bible prophesied. He required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast. There's your one world religion. Whose fatal wound had been healed. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down to the earth from the sky while everyone was watching. And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived, pause right there, highlight the word deceived. One of the most important words translated from the original Greek manuscripts into our modern English Bibles and prophecy is the word deceived, deceive, and deception. Three forms of the same word. Deceive, deceived, and deception. It is the strong mark of the work of the last days. So don't be surprised. People are saying, well, I can't believe that the CDC deceived us. I can't believe that Dr. Fauci deceived us. I can't believe that this political leader just get used to it. It's going to get worse. Thank you for all those amens. Deceive, deceived, and deception is a growing corruption in the end time political system. That's why your allegiance must be to the house of God, to the word of God, and the things of God. Don't worry about this world. God's already got this world taken care of. But he has another covenant that we'll cover in the message, how to walk in the favor of God in the last days. We'll cover that more clearly. He deceived all the people who belong to this world. There's another global reference. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who's fatally, who was fatally wounded, then came back to life. The Antichrist is going to receive a fatal head wound. Most scholars believe in some form or fashion he'll be assassinated. Publicly it will be on the news, just as John F. Kennedy's assassination has been on the news and documentaries ever since. And it's graphic. 
But the Bible doesn't say specifically other than he'll be killed fatally with a head wound. But then miraculously raised back to life. This is a satanic copy and counterfeit of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus Christ was fatally wounded on the cross, head, hands, and feet, the Antichrist, as a counterfeit of Christ, is going to be killed and will recover from a head wound. The Bible tells us in verse 15, he was then permitted to give life to this statue so that it could speak. Then the statue of the beast commanded that anyone refusing to worship it must die. This global religion is going to be mandated. And all who do not submit and worship the Antichrist will be publicly executed. Verse 16, he required everyone. Here it is, don't miss it. Verse 16, he required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. In verses 16 and 17, we have introduced to us that one world economic system. To me, this is one of the great evidences of the authenticity of the scripture. Because as you may know, the book of Revelation, the last book in your Bible written by John who was being held in imprisonment on an island called Patmos, which is off of the west coast of Turkey in a region called Asia Minor. The Lord Jesus gave him this vision, told him to write it down. And as he's writing it down, he doesn't know it. But imagine a man writing down a global economic currency that in some fashion is computerized, maybe digital, we don't know. But imagine this is being written in A.D. 95. Some villages and towns are still trading doves, pigeons, sheep, goats. There wasn't currency globally when he wrote this, let alone some type of global currency that could be used on the back of the hand or on the forehead. So for those of you who follow the news who a few days ago, you saw that Amazon is introducing a technology where you'll place the back of your right hand under a scanner and do all of your transactions through that technology. By the way, that's not the mark of the beast. But what you're seeing in the 21st century, just like we have been, and I have to be careful, don't get mad at me. Please be a grown-up while I'm here. But I'm just going to be honest enough to tell you a lot of what's happened in the last two years has been the mental conditioning of the population. Condition to submit to things. Now, originally we were told they would always do it by science and data. But that lie fell apart within weeks. Because the science and the data has been all over the map. And even when the science and the data undid what they said was the science and the data, they still continued on with the mental submissive conditioning of the populace. Requiring children to wear masks in school. The odds of a child dying of this pandemic. Your child has ten times greater probability of being struck by lightning than dying of COVID. And a lot of it, I don't care what anybody says, a lot of this was either panic or fear or as the Bible said, political deception in the last days. And again, I don't have any dog on either side of the aisle. My faith is not in the White House. My faith is in God's house. But I want you to see it in the Bible. That in A.D. 95, John, who wrote the book of Revelation, prophesied a day on earth where there could be global economic transactions. By all he could describe was a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. That, my friend, is fascinating. Because in 95 A.D., whoever read this letter must have thought he had lost his mind. Global one world digital currency, what is he, 
What am I talking about? Verse 18, wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man and his number is 666. So there is the text and the context. And give me a few minutes tonight to unpack because there's a lot of meat on this bone. If they invited me to speak all week long on Revelation 13, I couldn't even begin to cover all of the prophecy content and all of the significant things that are hidden away like golden nuggets in this chapter. And the same is true of every chapter in the book of Revelation. If the Lord Jesus were to tarry, and I had the opportunity to come here every year and was asked to speak on Bible prophecy in my lifetime, if I had done it all 40 years that I've come here, I could not begin to cover it all. So please know tonight that I'm being humble enough to tell you I am not doing an exhaustive study of Revelation 13. But I am going to answer the question clearly, can a Christian take the mark of the beast accidentally? I'll never forget in a meeting some time ago, a very stately professional woman came up to me after the service and we were standing on the right side of the altar area and she said, do you have a moment I'd like to ask you a question? And her question was, she said, at my work, and she was a top executive with a big company. If I were to mention it, it's a finance company that almost everyone would recognize. And she had a long-term career and was in top executive management. But the top, top executive, she said, had been pulled into a meeting and told that because of cybersecurity risks, which is in the news almost on a daily basis now, Companies being hacked, our own country, a major oil line, oil company shut down by Russian hackers. Our government forced them to pay a $5 million pirating fee. And by the way, that's going to become more and more and more common in the last days. The question is how long before they hack our phones? How long before they hack our data? How long before they hold Americans hostage? And cybersecurity is a major issue in big companies. And so they were pulled into a meeting and said, we have hired and they had these days, three days of meetings with cybersecurity teams and counselors and consultants And everybody on the executive team, the higher floor of the building, they were told, we are requiring that you receive a microchip implant in the flesh of your right hand. It'll be injected in between the fatty flesh of the thumb and the forefinger, and it's smaller than a grain of rice, and you'll not feel it. You'll be able to Uh, Feel it if you're searching for it, but there's no pain. You won't feel it in the normal work of the day, etc. But it is mandatory for security reasons. She said, if I take that, is there any possibility that I would be taking the mark of the beast? She said, because I've already written my resignation letter and I'm going to resign. I said, now if God leads you to resign, feel free. But if you're asking me, is that the mark of the beast, and is there a penalty with God for receiving that, absolutely not. There is no concern that you should have in your heart about that any more than carrying an iPhone or a digital tablet or a credit card. Now some of you say, well, that's a pretty bold thing to say. What if? How many of you know that if you know the Bible, you can eliminate a lot of what ifs? So just as I confidently told that woman it was impossible for that to be the mark of the beast, when you leave tonight, you're going to understand why. Throughout my 40 years of ministry, she's not been the only one. And now it's becoming a question that I get almost everywhere I travel, and especially concerning the vaccine. Is there any chance, any chance whatsoever that there could be hidden markers in that vaccine. Now, I actually have a video from a prominent doctor that makes it very clear that there is 
a way of marking and identifying in the vaccine, not the full purpose of, just a side benefit for human trafficking purposes, etc. But we're not here tonight to discuss all of the random theories of doctors and scientists. We're here to start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible. But I will say this. Because there is such an overload of false prophets preaching on prophecy on social media, there is a tremendous amount of confusion on what the Bible says in prophecy. Let me tell you something, if I can be this blatant. If you're listening to somebody on social media that never preached on prophecy before COVID, but all of a sudden during COVID they became a prophecy expert, you're probably listening to the wrong person. If you're listening to someone on social media who claims to be an individual gifted in prophecy or a prophet or preaching on Bible prophecy, but they're preaching about politics, presidents, and vote counts, you're listening to a false prophet and you should be ashamed of yourself. But they'll say, you know, God spoke to them. Let me tell you something. God never says anything to anybody that violates what he's written in this book. And Bible prophecy is not about America. Bible prophecy is not about Donald Trump. Bible prophecy is not about Joe Biden. Bible prophecy is not about Democrats and Republicans in Washington, D.C. Bible prophecy is about Israel. Bible prophecy is about the Jewish people. Bible prophecy is about the covenant of God. And Bible prophecy is about the church of Jesus and the soon coming King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And if you're listening to somebody on social media and YouTube who's been prophesying for the last two years or year, year and a half about politics and presidents and vote counts, you've been scammed. Nobody that follows this ministry listens to that crap because I've taught them well. You go to the Bible for everything. You start in the Bible, you stay in the Bible, and you finish in the Bible. But Brother Shuttlesworth, you're being harsh. God speaks to people. He does. But he never speaks anything that violates what's in this. Did you hear me? He never speaks. Read the book of Revelation. Anyone who adds to it or takes away from it is cursed with a curse and their name will be stricken from the Lamb's book of life. God is very serious about protecting the integrity of what the Bible says. But they fasted for 21 days and God woke them up in the middle. Please, go home and slap yourself three times in the mirror and go to bed. Wake up smarter. But because there's such an absence of sound teaching, people get confused. And I'll just lovingly tell it. I understand why people get confused. They're listening to the wrong voices. Thank you for all of those amens. Let's get into the meat of this. The question that often arises on this subject, what if I take the mark of the beast? What if I'm left behind? What if I take the mark of the beast just because I want to make sure my children are fed or my grandbabies are taken care of? Surely God will show me mercy. I heard one of these social media prophets. Just because you figured out how to make a video on your iPhone does not mean you should have. And I heard one of these false prophets with an IQ less than the room temperature say, I am certain that if you take the mark of the beast after the rapture, but you're doing it because you're wanting to feed your children or your grandchildren, that God has mercy in his heart. Well, what does the Bible say? Revelation 14. Flip over one chapter. Revelation 14, verses 9 through 12. Then a third angel followed them, shouting, Anyone who worships the beast and his statue, or who accepts his mark on the forehead or on the hand, must drink the wine of God's anger. It has been pulled 
poured out full strength into God's cup of wrath. And they will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever and they will have no relief day or night for they have worshipped the beast and his statue and have accepted the mark of his name. This means that God's holy people must endure persecution patiently obeying his commands and maintaining their faith in Jesus. Two things that I want to point out there. Number one, the Bible leaves absolutely no room for misinterpretation. All who receive the mark will face the eternal wrath of God. Doesn't matter what your motivation is. The Bible is implicit. All who receive the mark must drink from the cup of God's wrath and anger. And they will be thrown into hell with eternal torment forever and forever. So I know this may not be popular, but do you want a preacher that makes you feel good? Because I can preach a message that will make you feel good all the way to hell. Or do you want a preacher that loves you enough to tell you the truth, even when it's awkward and uncomfortable, but it gets your feet onto the streets of gold and you make glory? I'm going to tell you the truth. Revelation 14 leaves absolutely no room for other than liberal, perverted interpretation. Anyone who takes the mark, for whatever reason, has destined themselves to face the wrath of God. And there is no exception to that. Why do you think Jesus, when he was on the earth, said this, and people didn't realize it to be prophecy, but it was actually prophecy. Jesus, speaking of the great tribulation, said, but during that time, woe unto mothers who are nursing. Why do you think Jesus said that? Talking about the great tribulation, when all of these five political agendas and the Antichrist is turned loose, why do you think Jesus warned of that? Woe unto mothers. The word woe coming from the heart of Jesus was like grief of the highest degree from the original. Woe unto mothers that are nursing. Jesus was referring to mothers in the great tribulation. It's one thing for you to say I'm not going to take the mark of the beast. Because the Bible says if you don't take the mark of the beast, no one can buy or sell anything without it. Why do you think we're being conditioned not to be able to do things without certain marks or certain mandates? It's a mental conditioning for what's coming, but it cannot be fully released until after the rapture. Woe unto mothers. It's one thing for you to know that if you take the mark that you're eternally damned and you make up your mind, I'll never take the mark. And the Bible tells us that a multitude of people will be saved during the Great Tribulation who will refuse the mark, and the Bible says they'll be publicly executed and beheaded. They'll be martyred for the cause of the gospel and for refusing the mark. It's one thing for you to make that decision. But imagine a mother or a grandmother who every day is listening to a screaming baby day and night Because either her natural milk has dried up or she has no money to buy milk and she's starving to death and because she's starving to death, her babies or her grandbabies are starving to death. It would take a pretty special mother or grandmother to hold that baby and say, we're both going to have to perish for the sake of eternity in your soul. Jesus said, woe unto mothers, because very few mothers will be able to pass that test. Very few mothers and grandmothers will be able to pass that test. Think of it. Holding your own baby or your own grandbaby in your arms with a swollen stomach as they're starving to death. Screaming in hunger pains 24 hours a day and slowly dying. I'm not trying to make this any more graphic than what it is, I'm trying to explain to you why Jesus said, woe unto mothers during that time. 
Well, what can you take away from that in a practical way? That's why you need to live ready every day to meet Jesus. That's why when I give the invitation in these meetings, you should have an urgency of bringing friends and family in. Because many of you have friends and family that if the rapture were to take place tonight, they'd be left behind and they're going to face these awful, dreadful, apocalyptic scenarios. You see, in America, we've become far too soft. We've become too soft. Because in America, if I were to stand here and tell you that I have a, a billionaire donor who wants to remain anonymous, and I don't, but if the Lord sends one, I'll gladly receive it. But if I were to tell you I had a billionaire donor who would like to remain anonymous, but in every crusade, he has authorized me to write you a check for a million dollars if you bring somebody unsaved into the meeting between now and Wednesday night and they were to get saved. Almost everybody listening to me would be sure to bring somebody into these meetings that needs Christ. Probably pews full. Many of you would rent buses. You would go onto the highways and byways and compel them to come in. You would interpret that passage of scripture, compel them to come in, and you would use duct tape and pepper spray. And you would load a bus. And when that one soul that you brought got saved and I handed you the million dollar check, you would be more excited about the money than their soul. America has become soft. That's the urgency that we need to have about winning the lost. People ask me, say, you know, at your age, why are you still going to the Arctic Circle? Why don't you send one of your associate evangelists up there? Because this isn't a career. I'm not a hireling. No amount of money could stop me from reaching the unreached. I am not going to retire. Now, if you've got a retirement plan, I applaud it. You can and should make plans to retire from a secular job. But I don't have a secular job. I have a holy calling. And I can't retire from that. As long as I have the ability to preach the gospel, explain the scriptures and call people to Christ, I'm going to do my best. Many of you remember Billy Graham, late in life, in his 90s, sitting on his rocking chair on his porch in Montreat, North Carolina, as they prepared his last message and put together video and graphics and so on. But they kept coming back to small clips of him sitting in that rocking chair. Many of you may not know it. I have friends inside that ministry, but he was actually at that stage of life blind. But he sat in that rocking chair and had made one last plan to preach the gospel. They know for a fact that over a billion people around the world heard the gospel that night because they had made efforts to satellite it throughout the globe. And potentially his last message, sitting in a rocking chair on his porch, more people received Christ than in any of his great stadium crusades. Why? Because it wasn't a job. Billy Graham knew what I know and what many of you know. There really is a heaven. There really is a hell. Jesus said in Mark's gospel in the 8th chapter, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? My whole life is driven by that. I want to reach lost men and women and boys and girls. And so it's why I'm not politically correct. I love you enough to just tell you what the Bible says. And Jesus said, woe unto mothers. Let me come to the end of this message. And there's so much here that I, as I told you in the very beginning, cannot cover. But let me conclude by giving you quickly eight, if you're taking notes, Eight ways we know that the mark of the beast has not yet been revealed. Now let me help you with just a preliminary explanation. I believe that whatever the technology of the mark of the beast is, some evolution of that may already be on planet earth. But the mark of the beast is not yet here 
some form of the technology. I mean, technology, it used to take years for technology to change. Then it took months. Then it took weeks. Now it takes days. And many of you, if you've ever worked for the government or especially for the military, most of you know it's common knowledge. It's not some conspiracy theory. It's common knowledge that the technologies that are released to the public in America, usually our military has had access to those technologies for 10, 20, maybe 30 years. And the highest technologies are kept for the military. It's in the news right now. UFOs. No longer fiction. No longer sci-fi movies. No longer something that's speculation that cannot be proven. They have released multiple hundreds of videos from our pilots and our military. UFOs. Unidentified flying objects. What are they? They probably know. You think they're going to tell us? Prior to World War III, by the way, there will be a World War III in the Great Tribulation. Many scholars allow for five world wars in the tribulation, a total of seven. We've already had two. The Bible clearly defines a nuclear war. But don't miss this. Whatever the technology of the mark of the beast is, may already be hidden somewhere. But it cannot, don't miss this, it cannot be revealed until after the rapture of the church. There will never be, write it down, there will never be a mark of the beast available to a believer prior to the rapture. Now that's quite a bold statement. That's why I gave it to you up front. I close with this. Eight ways we know the mark of the beast has not yet been revealed. Number one, go to verse 11 of chapter 13. Then I saw another beast come up out of the earth. He had two horns like those of a lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. And I mentioned to you that this refers to the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the dragon of Satan, the unholy trinity. Since the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the Satan who is mentioned as the dragon are not in our world and not ruling, the mark of the beast has not yet been revealed. Reason number one. Reason number two, just go down to verse 12. He exercised all the authority of the first beast, required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. Since the Antichrist has not only not been revealed, but certainly has not globally been witnessed to have received a fatal head wound and has not recovered and because there's not yet a one world religion the mark of the beast has not yet been revealed go down another verse verse 13 number three he did astounding miracles even making fire flash down to earth from the sky while everyone is watching since the Antichrist has not been revealed on this earth and has not validated his presence on the earth with miracles of fire flashing down from the sky to the earth for everyone in the world to see, the mark of the beast has not yet been revealed. Number four, verse 14, go down one more verse. With all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belonged to this world. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded, then came back to life. Since a global leader, the Antichrist, has not risen to power, has not yet deceived the totality of the world's population, has not had a statue commissioned in his likeness after being resurrected from the dead for the whole world to see. The mark of the beast has not yet been revealed. Verse 15, one more verse, go down. Number five, he was then permitted to give life to this statue so that it could speak. Then the statue of the beast commanded that anyone refusing to worship it must die. Since the Antichrist is a global leader, has not been revealed on the earth, does not have a visible statue commissioned of his image throughout the earth, has not yet enforced a one world religion 
with death penalty for all who refuse to worship, the mark of the beast has not yet been revealed. Let me pause there for a moment and help you with something that will be very practical. Many of you remember not long ago that in crazed demonic frenzy, people for whatever reason, and there were multiple reasons given, they began to attack the statues of the earth. You saw it almost every night on the news for quite a period of time. There were reasons stated as to why people in demonic hatred and frenzy began to attack statues. But that all crumbled and fell apart because they also began to attack and burn and break and destroy and defame statues that were heroes of the causes they said they represented. It just became a random, riotous, demonic frenzy of attack upon statues. And it was like watching demon-possessed people screaming, beating, jumping up and down on them, shooting them, lighting them on fire, dragging them down the street, trying to throw them in rivers, on and on. It was like literally watching demon-possessed people in an unbridled frenzy. Now, that probably didn't hit a chord with, with many of you, but I remember the first night that I was home sitting with my wife watching the news and watching all of this go down in our country and thinking, how much longer before the rapture takes place? And the Lord brought to my spirit that Revelation clearly promised that when the Antichrist is brought into a global position of world domination, he will commission a statue of himself and they always seat the number one statue commission in their seat of authority, which will be Jerusalem. But history tells us, and we've all, any of you that have studied history, these people not only commission a main statue, they have hundreds and thousands of them replicated and placed throughout their regions of authority. And I thought, I wonder if the hatred and the riotous demonic behavior that seems to be behind this why for the first time in world history are statues being ripped from their pedestals is it possible that Satan is getting ready to put another statue on all those vacant pedestals for the world will have a one world religion where all will be forced to bow before those statues globally and worship or face the death penalty. I'm not saying that is what it is. I'm just saying it's more than curious to me that for the first time in American history and in global history, we saw this hatred of statues being randomly ripped from their pedestals, many and most of which have never been replaced. Those pedestals stand waiting for whatever is commissioned to be put in their place. Go down to verse 16. Number 6. He required everyone. Verse 16. He required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or forehead. Since there is not an obvious global leader who has successfully passed a law mandating everyone in the world to receive a mark on the right hand or on the forehead, the mark of the beast is not on this planet yet. Reason number seven, go down one more verse. We're literally just walking down through Revelation 13, exegeting Scripture. Verse 17, no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Since there is not a global currency in place requiring everyone in the world to be mandated to use it under penalty of death, the mark of the beast is not yet here. Number 8, verse 18. Wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Since the arrival of the Antichrist and the mystery of the number of 666 are not known, the mark of the beast is not yet revealed. I wanted to close with those eight reasons, and I want you to remember that I never left the Bible. 
I walked you down through Revelation 13, verse by verse, and just simply explained eight reasons from Bible prophecy why we know the mark of the beast is not here. Now let me close with a very definitive statement. There will never be a mark of the beast available until after the rapture of the church. No Christian prior to the rapture will ever accidentally take the mark of the beast. For the mark of the beast even in the tribulation is not taken accidentally. It is taken willingly and submissively and not even for economic reasons. The economic reasons of the mark of the beast is the second prophetic reason but not the main reason. It is a willing mark of identification that you worship and surrender yourself to the Antichrist not only as a global leader but as your one world religion whom you bow and worship. Don't miss this. The mark of the beast is not actually the first mark. Just like the Revelation 13 reveals the unholy trinity, which is a counterfeit of the holy trinity. The holy trinity, once again, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Revelation 13 reveals after the rapture, the revelation of the unholy trinity, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. The mark of the beast is a counterfeit of God's mark. The original mark is God's mark on the foreheads of the 144,000 Jewish witnesses that God is going to raise up in the great tribulation. Don't miss this. This is absolute Bible prophecy gold. Don't miss it. One of the things that I love not only about the Bible but is clear throughout Bible prophecy is even in the height of God's most dramatic apocalyptic judgment the seven years of great tribulation God always leaves a witness on the earth for the good news of the gospel and for people who have hope and opportunity to be saved and even though the seven years of great tribulation are going to be beyond definition Jesus said if God had not shortened the days of the great tribulation none could survive The Bible also tells us that the greatest revival the world will ever see is during the Great Tribulation. Because the Bible says that the way God will raise up the gospel in the Great Tribulation, the Scripture says there will be a number saved so great that no man can number them. From every tribe, from every people, from every nation, from every ethnicity. Because even in the Great Tribulation, God will leave a witness of the gospel. And one of the main ways that God will witness the gospel in the great tribulation, and I don't have time to preach on it tonight, but the Bible says in Revelation, he'll raise up 12,000 Jewish evangelists from each of the 12 tribes. Don't ever forget the centerpiece of eschatology is not the church, it's Israel and the Jewish people. There's a reason why the GPS location for end time prophecy is Israel. Because God made a covenant over 3,000 years ago establishing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel forever. By the way, I'll throw one little piece of gold in for free tonight. Many of you didn't take note of the fact that in 2018 something prophetically significant happened. One of the greatest fulfillments of prophecy in your lifetime took place in 2018. Actually two. One was the birth of a red heifer. Now many of you say, what? In Jewish ritual, they cannot, it's an offering and a ritual called the offering or the ritual of justification. And for that ritual, the Jewish people, by Jewish law, have to have the ashes of a perfect red heifer. Not just red in color. Everything about that heifer is red. Its hooves, its flesh, its nose, its hair. They only allow all of the hairs of the body of that red heifer. There are only two white hairs allowed in its certification process. If there are more than two white hairs or hairs of any other color, it cannot be a perfect red heifer used for the offering of justification. 
We know that there's going to be a building of the third Jewish temple, probably in the first half of the Great Tribulation. We may see the beginning of the building of the third temple before the rapture. I'm saying may, not will, may. But we know for an absolute fact that by the time we're three and a half years into the tribulation, the third temple is built up and functional. For the Bible says that the Antichrist will desecrate it in the three and a half year middle point of the great tribulation. That was the one miracle of 2018 that many of you missed. There was the certification of a red heifer that passed every Jewish test. And the rabbinic council certified it and announced it. Believe it or not, they have a Twitter account. The Temple Institute in Jerusalem has a Twitter account, which I subscribe to, and that's how I found it. And I'll never forget the morning that I opened it up, and it said that a red heifer had been certified. Instinctively, I jumped to my feet on the hair on the back of my neck rose up because there has never been a red heifer since the days of Jesus. There have only been nine in history. And this was the tenth. And they cannot certify the third temple without the ashes of a red heifer. In 2018, the final red heifer to ever be born was born is alive. They don't need to wait. They can sacrifice it at any time. All they need is the ashes. And they can do many rituals from the ashes. But think of it. Never since the days of Christ and the second temple, which was destroyed in AD 70 by the Roman invasion of Titus, but never since the days of Christ, from the days of Christ until 2018, never a certified red heifer. Bible prophecy said one has to be born before they can certify the new temple. It was born in 2018. Let me tell you something more significant than that. The book of Daniel contains many prophecies. The book of Daniel in the Old Testament is the first cousin of the book of Revelation in the New Testament. And Daniel prophesies about 70 sets of seven. I'll not get into it. But I will explain the great miracle of 2018. Our former president officially recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel along with many allied nations around the world. How many of you remember that being in the news? Like him or hate him has nothing to do with it. I'm just telling you that he certified and moved our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem as a token of faith. And certified Jerusalem as the official capital of Israel. Do you remember the date? May 14th, 2018. You remember Daniel and his prophecy of the 70 sets of seven? When was Israel reborn as a nation? May 14th, 1948. 70 years to the day Jerusalem was certified. As the capital of Israel, May 14th, 2018. I close by telling you this. Don't miss this. If you're gambling against Bible prophecy, don't ever go to Vegas. If you knew Bible prophecy in detail, you would never leave this service without making peace with God. Because don't miss this. Musicians, would you come? By the way, I am going to do my best as I did tonight throughout the week. Uh, this church is always gracious about getting the service early to me. How many of you enjoy listening to Bible prophecy? How many of you realize that there are certain things that you can't preach on in 10 minutes or 15 minutes? You can't preach and teach on Bible prophecy in a little 10-minute nugget. There's just, it needs a little respect. It needs a little explanation. It needs a little, as we say in Bible college, exegesis. That's why I took you verse by verse through Revelation 13 so that you'll know it's not my opinion. It's not a YouTube video. It's not clickbait. Straight from the pages of Bible prophecy. Now, when you understand the timing of the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is an, a vision given in chronological order. The church is mentioned in chapters 2 and 3. By the way, if you're taking notes, write this down. One of the most important things about the book of Revelation, let me give it to you. It'll help you all week long. 
When Jesus gives the vision to John on the Isle of Patmos and tells him to write it down, he begins by Revelation 1-3, which I've explained to you, the supernatural blessing, all who read the words of this prophecy to the church, all who listen to them and obey them, that supernatural blessing, that's important. Equally important is verse 19. Because in verse 19, Jesus gives John writing down the vision of Revelation, the exact simple outline of the entire vision. It's three parts. Write down the things which you've seen. Verse 19, if you have your Bible, it's right there, read it. Write down the things which you've seen, the things which are, and the things which will be. That's the three-part outline of the book of Revelation. Once again, Revelation is the only book in the Bible incentivized with a supernatural blessing, Revelation 1-3. But it's also the only book in the Bible that gives its own chronological outline. Because I think Jesus knew how much debate there'd be among last-day liberal modern scholars who are trying to explain away Bible prophecy. So he left an outline of the proper chronology of interpreting the book in verse 19. Chapter 1 is the introduction to the book. And John writes down the things that he has seen. Then he said, write down the things which now are. That's chapters 2 and 3. And in chapters 2 and 3, John writes seven letters to seven literal churches. All of those churches were real churches. And they were all located in a circle around the Isle of Patmos where he was in prison. And these letters went to them, literal letters to literal churches. But prophetically, they also happened to be a prophetic chronology of the church age. What's the church age? Jesus said in Matthew 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. When Jesus said that to his disciples outside of Caesarea Philippi, there had never been a church before. So Jesus prophesied the church age. When does the church age begin? It began in Acts chapter 2 with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 was the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jesus in Matthew 16, the beginning of the church age. When does the church age end? It ends with the rapture of the church. The church in all of history is a short window of opportunity. It began in the upper room in the first century, and it ends with the rapture of the church. Jesus mentions the church 19 times in those two chapters. But after Revelation 3 and verse 22, the church is never mentioned again. As a matter of fact, Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 are the rapture of the church. All of the exact same verbiage that Paul used to describe the rapture in 1 Thessalonians to the church at Thessalonica, John used the exact same descriptive terms in Revelation 4, verses 1 and 2. A sound, a voice, a trumpet, come up here, heaven, presence of Christ, all of the same verbiage is identical. So that's really important if you have your Bible, make note of that. Revelation 4 verses 1 and 2 is the rapture. How do we know that? Because the church is never mentioned again from Revelation chapter 3 and verse 22 until the closing remarks of Revelation chapter 22. The prelude to the great tribulation is chapters 4 and 5. And the great tribulation begins in Revelation chapter 6 and goes through Revelation 18. Some theologians include chapter 19. Specifically, I designate 19 as the second coming of Christ, which ends the great tribulation. But the church is never mentioned again after Revelation 3.22. Why is that so vitally important to what I've preached tonight? Because we were in Revelation 13 tonight. So the great tribulation began in chapter 6, goes through chapter 18, Revelation 13, the chronology, the timing of that chapter is in the great tribulation. Why is that so important to us walking away tonight? Because the mark of the beast is revealed in Revelation 13, which is in the great tribulation. You will never see the mark of the beast unless you're left behind. And so if you want to avoid 
all of the horror, all of the judgment. The Bible says that over half of the world's population is going to be eliminated through judgments, wars, pestilences. By the way, speaking of COVID, pestilence is one of the four main prophecies of the last days. And COVID was a blip on the radar compared to the pestilences coming in the Great Tribulation. And now it seems that in the last few days, there is now evidence. We'll wait to see if anybody's ever prosecuted for it. But now there is evidence, no longer conspiracy theory, evidence that this pandemic was manufactured. May have been intended for war, may have been intended for other wicked purposes. But the evidence is now clear and concise. It was man manufactured. Pestilences in the Great Tribulation will wipe out millions. And this is just the frustration of the Antichrist, Satan, and the false prophet waiting to be birthed, but they cannot be birthed until the rapture of the church. Stand to your feet. Let me close before I give the invitation by reading 2 Thessalonians 2.8. 